I'll, I'll start off with some words from Nigel Calder, who's an international expert on diesel engines. And I quote his words. He says, diesel engines are remarkably simple in principle and require little in the way of maintenance, although what little is required is essential to a long life. He's, he's right there. Uh, he says, provided it's properly installed and well maintained, the modern diesel engine is an amazingly dependable piece of equipment. That's why they use it in submarines, by the way. As a result, it has moved from being an auxiliary to center stage in terms of energy production, energy not just for propulsion, but for the provision of power for the entire portfolio of electrical systems that found on modern yachts. Fundamentally, the high standard of living on our boats that we know all take for granted rests entirely on the reliability of modern diesels. That's Nigel's words. Um, we very often take it for granted that our diesel engine will reliably start at the press of a button and provide the propulsion and energy generation power is needed pretty much instantly, but it does much, much more. Nowadays, it's arguably more important role is in providing the electrical power via its charging system and battery banks, which enable us to use navigation systems, anchor winch, sail winches, navigation lighting, interior lighting, radar, chart plotter, AIS, DSC, HFSSB, Iridium, wind instruments, echo sounders, logs, cabin heaters, air conditions, and water makers, which is a, a big load, I can tell you. When you think about it, all of this wonderful equipment, which has revolutionized our sailing today, is totally dependent on the reliability of our diesel engines. The key to reliability is, of course, proper installation, good operating procedures, and ongoing preventive maintenance. Uh, what you can see here is uh, basically installing a, an engine in a boat is a complex affair, but there are two types of installation. And one is for an engine above the waterline, and the other is for uh, an installation, an engine mounted below the waterline. And if you look at the left hand diagram there, you'll see in a point C, which is the injection bend where the red uh, water comes out, the hot gases. That's the point which is measured uh, from there to the waterline. So if that point is above the waterline, it's an above the waterline installation. And you can see the dimensions that are necessary to install a property there. And on the right hand side, you can see a below the waterline engine. And you can see that the, the dimensions are completely different. It's critical that all engine installations conform to those. Loss of cooling water will very, very quickly cause your engine to overheat and initiate the temperature alarm on the engine control panel. If the panel is not directly visible to the helm, and if the noise level is such that the audible alarm is unheard, then unless the engine is shut down immediately, the uncooled exhaust gases will ignite the exhaust hose and the thermoplastic water lock muff muffler unit, the beaters units will melt and the engine exhaust gases plus coolant will be pumped into the bilge, a dangerous and alarming scenario to be avoided at all costs. As a result of that, specifying the best option engine control panel is an excellent idea, as it will incorporate uh, both uh, a taco and both oil and temperature gauges connected to oil pressure and temperature sensors uh, with alarms fitted to the engine. These gauges with an easy side of the helm will allow earning, early warning of loss of coolant and loss of oil pressure and provide immediate visual and oral alarms if the engine is in danger of oil pressure loss or coolant loss and high end. With below the water installations, if not properly done, the inlet cooling water can continue to siphon into the engine after the engine is stopped and fill up the exhaust system, causing a hydraulic and subsequent expensive damage. Uh, this depressing scenario is avoided by the installation of a siphon, as you saw, mounted above the waterline between the thermostat and the exhaust elbow water injection pipe. And it is vital in all below the waterline engine installation. Okay, we we'll, we'll go on to the fuel system. Uh, fuel contamination and other water-related 
problems account for approximately 90% of all these engine breakdowns. So it makes a lot of sense to ensure that you have a fuel system designed to greatly reduce or eliminate such problems. Good tank design and construction, ISO quality hoses, and a top quality water separator primary filter will eliminate many future fuel problems and benefit reduce fuel system and engine repairs. Nowadays, most steel installers will for preference specify a polypropylene rotor molded tank in an opaque color, which allows you to instantly, instantly see your fuel level. These tanks can be easily molded to your design and template, so it makes sense to avail of this benefit and design your tank to best practice with a drain sump and drain cock and an easy access tank hatch on its top surface allowing access for cleaning and through which the fuel drawn return pipes will be fitted, plus the tank vent, all of which will have valves fitted. If required, a tank gauge can be fitted also, but modern external units can be fitted to the outside of the tank to display fuel levels uh, by gauges. Last week, I helped a friend of mine work on his fuel system because we had trouble on bringing it back up from Cork. After going through some overfalls off with the head, the engine slowed and then stopped. And I recognized it as uh, probably water in the fuel. And we had a sales up, so we continued on a bit. And when we got into Greystones, I, I, I sorted the problem out. In Dublin last week, I fitted a, a, a brand new top quality uh, fuel filter, primary fuel filter. And then we took the top off the tank. Fortunately, I had a, an access there. And we found, uh, we pumped out two litres of water from underneath the fuel. Now, that was very alarming. And we could see the difference was slightly emulsified. And uh, it was a, a ferocious amount of water. And that tank had been cleaned for quite a long time. So it's a good tip to put a, some kind of a vacuum pump down into your, near the bottom of your tank and take out a litre or two and see if it's water or fuel. If you do that, it will go a long way to ensuring you won't have the sort of problems we had. So keeping water out of your fuel is important, but it's actually difficult because every time you buy fuel, you're going to get water and you're going to get some contaminants. And an excellent way of ensuring clean fuel in your new tank is to purchase a rack or fuel filtration filter funnel and always fill your tank through that funnel. The two metal Fine mesh filters within the funnel will trap water and debris within the funnel top, allowing only clean diesel into your tank. The engine fuel filter system is your next decision. And for blue water ocean sailors, there would be no choice but the best possible system available, akin to the one I fitted last week, uh, preferably a rack or 500 unit system. Now, that's a very good fuel filter in several ways because the filter is put in from the top. You just open the top, it has a kind of a T brass handle. Lift the top off, the filter inside lifts out, you put the new filter down into it, put the top back on and you don't even have to clean it. It's a tremendous filter, very, very good quality. This, this primary fuel filter will be fitted somewhere between the tank outlet draw pipe and the engine fuel lift pump. And I strongly recommend mounting the filter assembly in a very easily accessible location where the disposable filter unit can be replaced without having to dismantle anything else. A good location is, in my opinion, somewhere at the front side of the engine where it's instantly accessible when the front engine cover is open. That's where I fit this last week. I also recommend that a large plastic container be fitted underneath into which fuel and the old filter can be dumped while replacing and later disposal. This container can be used to store spare filters for the primary and secondary filtering units, plus the tools required for bleeding the fuel system after any filter is replacement. I also recommend that all bleed screws that could be two or three are painted with yellow paint for easy identification. And the tools required for opening those bleed screws should also be identified with this paint and kept in that container underneath. It's helpful if you can mount your fuel tank so that your lowest fuel level is above the level of your bleed screws on your primary and secondary filter assemblies. And then you will need little effort to bleed your fuel system as gravity will do it for you by simply opening the bleed screw, either the injector one or, or the secondary fuel filter assembly and closing it when fuel without bubbles feeds through and bubble-free fuel appears. Do not over-tighten the bleed screw when putting it back. 
It goes without saying that only the best ISO certified fuel piping is used throughout your fuel system with double clamps on all hose barbs and that all hoses are clipped securely to panels and kept away from all moving parts and heat from the exhaust. Where existing fuel tanks are concerned, I strongly recommend that owners empty and thoroughly clean their tanks every three years now. Biodiesel is a major problem now. It's hygroscopic. It attracts more water than the old diesel used to. And you will be astonished and alarmed at the amount of water and debris which you will extract with your tax unless you've been remarkably diligent about the condition of your fuel supply and its filtration before filling in your tank. Now, if you're going long distance cruising or circumnavigation or anything, you have no idea of the quality of the fuel you'll be fitting. So it makes sense to take those precautions. By the way, I, I deplore the habit of yacht designers and boat manufacturers who cite the fuel tank filler caps alongside decks, which are frequently awash with seawater or rainwater. No matter how good the filler cap is when due, its rubber roaring seal will eventually degrade and leak and water will enter the fuel tank. In my opinion, fuel filler caps should be cited on vertical surfaces that they are on cars, but there you are, nobody listening. To electrical system, briefly, the electrical system in modern vessels is a great deal more important than it used to be. Vessels are now fitted with a multitude of electrical systems which require an adequate battery bank and, more importantly, a power generation system closely matched. It's vital to ensure that any electrical installation is properly installed by experienced marine electricians using best quality wiring, tin copper wire, and the highest quality components. And when purchasing a new vessel, you can ensure electrical integrity by demanding the best specification electrical system you can afford. This will not be a problem if you're purchasing a Nordic bib vessel from Swan, Halbert, Rassi, Mallow, and Najed or Arcona. These Nordic boat builders are highly regarded for the build quality and integrity of their boats, and though they cost quite a lot, there's no doubt whatever that they represent extremely good value as retail prices will attest. The heart of most marine power generation systems is your engine alternator. Almost all marine diesels are supplied fitted with automotive type alternators. Now, these are just about adequate, but not well suited to marine power generation requirements as their internal rectifiers are designed to taper off charge when the battery reaches 75% of full charge. Now, uh, to give you an idea what this means, if you're talking about a 100 uh, amp battery, when you're at 50% of charge, the battery is flat. And so consequently, uh, when your alternator charges it up, it charges it up another 25%. So you have 25 amps of usable current. Now, if you, if you fit a smart regulator to your system, you can you could wire it into your alternator. Uh, the smart regulator will, will allow the battery to charge up to 95%, which gives you another 20%, which almost doubles your battery capacity on that battery. So it makes a great deal of sense to fit those smart regulators. It has a much greater battery capacity, of course, Today's alternators are much more powerful than before, and, and a, a 30 horsepower engine today would come with a 125 amp alternator as standard. These combined with the smart rectifiers are well capable of maintaining charge in a 400 to 500 amp house battery bank and would be adequate for most off-grid vessels at anchor. Circumnavigators and ocean races will require much higher levels of generation here too backup and doubled up alternators and hydro generators akin to the watt and sea units which are similar to output drive legs with propellers which drive integral alternators in the lower leg. These cope better with the high amp usage of autopilots, you know, AIS and instruments and everything else on these vessels. RV, the recreational vehicle industry, now leads the way in off-grid living akin to liveaboard sailors. Um, they have reliable solar electrical technology, which provides uh, safer cooking with electrical hobs, grills, microwaves, and ovens uh, without the use of gas living, which provided you have lithium, lithium batteries. These are a fantastic solution for uh, safe cooking aboard boats. If you like to uh, look at YouTube, uh, there's a couple there, Gone with the Wind, W-Y-N-N-S. Uh, watching them, uh, you get a good idea of, of what they did with 
and throwing out our gas and using only electrics. They have a, a video on that. It's very, very interesting. It's much, much, much safer to gas. I, I recently uh, updated my own uh, gas cooker, uh, installing a high-quality French domestic unit, grilled hob unit, and shortly after installation, I smelled gas, which alarmed me. What I did not know when I bought it was that French gas tubing is one millimeter smaller in turn diameter than UK and the Irish gas tube. So consequently, the, the one uh, jubilee clip I had on the, the tube on the inlet to the, the gas oven wasn't enough. I added two more and the, the problem was resolved. Now that's, a, that's dangerous. So I, I, I would say to you, if you buy a French unit, you will find that the, the barb, the hose barb of putting gas into it is smaller than the hose pipe in your boat. So be careful of that. It's, it's a safety thing, uh, which I thought would be uh, worthwhile mentioning. Okay, we go on to engine operation, which I think is a very important thing. Okay, your engine start procedure is more or less automatic, and most of us don't think about it. We just turn the key and start it. But, but it's, it's vital to be aware of what occurs when you turn the key. When you turn the key to the first position, it will activate the engine alarm light and uh, activate the buzzer or siren. It, it's important to check that these lights are all there and that the, the buzzer is operating. And this confirms that your engine alarm sensor circuits and lamps are operational. Now, when you turn the key to the next position, uh, what will happen is the, the starter motor will be activated, the engine will start, and very, very shortly after that, the lights and the alarm will go off. That tells you that the sensors on your engine are operating as they should. I think that's pretty important. And if this doesn't occur when you start your engine, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really untie your lines and go anywhere and you have a sort of out. If it, when the lamps have gone off or if the lights, the buzzer doesn't work, you shouldn't really operate until you get things sorted. After that, the, the next thing I would say about operating is that you should nip up to the stern of the boat and look up to see if the water is coming out through the exhaust. That's pretty important. And it's no harm to take a, a, a brief moment to look at the flow and get used to it uh, so that you know if the flow is reduced at any, at any time and check if there's any smoke uh, or any change in the condition of the exhaust. Oven. The last thing, which I don't think you need to do every time, but it's, it's worth doing, is to have a look at the water, seawater pump in the engine and see if it's dripping. If it's dripping, it means that the uh, seal in the impeller chamber has broken down and you need to get that fixed because it, it means that you're not getting the coolant going through your boat and engine that you should. So you'll need to replace that seal and, and later on I'll tell you how to do how to get over that and how to do it in extremes. If your engine has laid up on use for a significant period before you start it, uh, it's a good idea to pull the stop handle or press the stop button while crank your engine over for about five revolutions until the oil pressure light goes on. That means that you've ensured that all the bearings and, and journals are lubricated and can start your engine normally. Once started and warmed up for a few minutes, you can engage gear and motor away. Once your engine is started, immediately check that a good stream of cooling water is visible at the exhaust. Lastly, it makes sense to briefly check the operation of your engine controls by selecting forward, neutral, and reverse before casting off. Do take a moment to pause briefly in neutral when changing from forward to reverse gear and vice versa. And doing so will greatly reduce wear on your drive train gearbox and clutch. Prolonged failure to do this will accelerate clutch wear. On a, a sailing vessel when motor sailing, do reef down and avoid excessive heel anchors. If your engine is giving problems with startling or failing to start within three attempts, then you have a problem which needs to be urgently examined and remedied to avoid adding further problems such as a failing starter motor or a flooded engine. Poor starting is a problem which should be investigated once as failure to do so will inevitably short out the starter motor. And much of the time the remedy is simple and related to fuel, but in older engines it may be related to cylinder compression or leaky valves. But in any case, it requires investigation and remedy to avoid embarrassing or potentially dangerous situations when your engine will not start. 
If it doesn't start in three attempts, then stop and turn off the seawater cooling seacock before making any further attempts. The reason for this is that every time you rotate the engine to try and start it, you're pumping water into the exhaust system. And if you continue to pump it in and the engine doesn't fire up and blow the water out of the exhaust, you will steadily fill the exhaust pipe once it comes up the pipe and backs into your exhaust valves and into your cylinders. When that happens, you get a hydraulic lock because the non-starting engine hasn't forced the cooling water out of the exhaust system. If you flood the engine in this manner, it's likely to be an extremely expensive repair and quite possibly an engine right off. If after you've turned off the seawater and you found the problem and addressed it, you have to be take care to open the seacock once again the moment your engine starts. When using your engine, do remember that you can harm it by treating it too gently, which can glaze the cylinder bores with unburned fuel and reduce compression rapidly. Now, Diesel engines are very simple and put there all about compression. And if you reduce compression, it really means your engine will lose power and it, it will be hard to start. It will be tough on your battery and your start motor. So it's important not to run it and tick over or low loads or a neutral battery charging while moored up. Battery charging on their engine is best done while motoring. And if you must try charge your engine while turning up alongside, and put your engine in forward or reverse gear to increase the load. Always remember that these engines thrive on hard rock. And the reason for that is that they have to be at an operating temperature, which burns all the fuel. Failure to do that would mean that the cylinders are glazed and you lose compression. Now, what do I mean by hard work? Uh, by that, I mean running under load at higher revolutions. Your manual will tell you that if your engine runs at wide open throttle at 3,800 revs, then you should cruise under engine at between 2,200 and 2,800 revs for much of the time. It's good practice to increase engine revs to near max for a short period, say three to four minutes, every four hours or so, if motoring at lower revolution. What that will do is it will clear the engine's throat, it will clear hydrocarbons out of the exhaust system and the engine cylinders, and it's a very good practice. Quite a lot of people like to motor at lower revs because it's less noisy, it's more economical and all that. And that's probably okay provided you, you do what I say every couple of hours or so, bring the engine up to high revs for three or four minutes. Your hull form should allow you to motor fast without squatting, but if your stern squats, then you should reduce rev until you level out as squatting is a very inefficient way to motor. And any increase of revs at that point will not mean an increase in speed, but will well overload your engine and stern and will not burn all the oil and you'll have black smoke going out of the back. Now, when approaching your destination, reduce engine revs to allow your engine to run cooler. And after berting, when you tie up after a prolonged period of motoring, then you should race your engine from low to maximum three or four times again to clear the cylinders and injectors. And this is particularly important when you have a turbocharged engine to allow it to cool down properly. And maybe a half an hour before getting to your berth, start to reduce the load on the engine and so that it runs a bit cooler coming in. What happens with turbochargers, if you don't cool it before turning it off, you'll fry all the oil in the oil pipes cooling the turbo bearings. And if that happens, the turbo will have a very short life and you'll have an expensive repair on your hands. So it's important to think about that. For very prolonged periods of engine use, I would recommend that you stop your engine at least once every 24 hours to check your new boy level fuel and coolant levels, bed tensions and the top up fluids and adjust types of temperatures. They're incredibly reliable engines and yours will remain so if you ensure that it is operated correctly. Is regularly serviced, has frequent oil and filter changes, and is always fed a healthy diet of clean, water free diesel fuel, clean air, and plentiful coolant. I would say that it's quite important for owners to take the trouble to read their engine operation handbook because there's terrific information in it and it's, it's worth implementing the excellent advice outlined within it. My advice is with that handbook that you should take the trouble to write in it the the serial numbers of your filters, your primary and secondary fuel filter, and your oil filter. You should note the service intervals, 
the correct lubricants and and also write the engine model and serial number in the handbook and also write the gearbox model serial number and its reduction rate ratio all of that information would be very helpful if you have a problem and you need parts so it's important to uh, have that info to hand most prudent sales will take a few minutes to check oil fuel and coolant levels before starting their engine a quick visual check of your primary filter glass bowl is a good idea too because you will see if there's any water in the bottom of the bowl if there is you find there's a drain at the bottom and you just open the drain and leave out the water and close the drain cock you won't even have to bleed the, the system while doing it. okay we spoke about dripping with the seawater pump earlier on you need to have the pump service but if, if you're in a remote place and there's no service man around. You can sort the problem out uh, if you have the necessary parts of all. Basically, the, the seal in, in the chamber, which is behind the impeller, has a metal spring, which pulls on the lid going around the impeller shaft. And, and that stops the water getting out. What happens is that that spring rusts because it's, it's made of steel, so it loses its pull around the seal and uh, what you can do if you have the part of all them it's easy enough to do it is uh, uh, make a, a little hoop with a, a paper clip pull the spring out and what you need to replace it is with a no-ring which is two mil larger than the impeller shaft now you obviously have to organize that before you need it uh, so the next time you check your impeller check the size of the shaft and go by a couple of o-rings two mil larger and you can you can put that um, o-ring where the spring used to be and that will sort you out and get you home i changed my spring when i replaced the seal the last time and that was four years ago and that rubber o-ring has worked perfectly ever since and it's a great tip uh, as an emergency to get you home of course the if when you do have the chance to get home and that uh, take your pump off and check it properly because uh, it may be that your bearings need to be changed as well and there's another seal at the back to keep the oil in uh, back to back too. so so it, that's a, a simple tip it's it's an easy job to do but you need to have the o-ring and you need to have it prepared what we have to remember about diesel engines is that they operate in a horrible environment very hostile cold wet uninsulated damp engine room over the five months of the winter which encourages corrosion and damp and uh, if during layoff if you can put a small tube heater onto the end during the layoff period uh, it'll greatly benefit your engine in the long term one thing i'll say about engines as well is that club racers very often unwittingly do a lot of damage to their engines because they come down to the boat and they start the engine and the weight onto the crew is coming so she's taking over for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and then they dash out to the start line and turn the engine off and sometimes the, the engine doesn't even get warmed up before they turn it off and that reduces the engine by quite a lot and i found during my time uh, servicing them that these particular engines and race posts were the ones that were most damaged by that kind of thing so it, it, it's worthwhile knowing it okay maintenance servicing and laying up your engine and at season end if you don't plan to use the boat over the winter this is the optimum time to arrange your end and engine service and also remedy any engine problems that you're aware of the following items need to be attended in the layup service and, and and this is the sequence i've always used for servicing. start the engine and warm it up under load with the gear for 15 minutes to warm the oil for easier extraction Stop the engine and drain out the old oil. Change the oil filter then, and, and then top up the new oil to the mark. I can't emphasize more strongly that the, the moment you get the oil filter back, the new oil filter in, put the new oil back in at that stage because you don't want to start your engine with everything. Check the level of the gearbox oil. Top up if necessary. Gearbox oil should be clear and golden and look like new. And generally speaking, it always is. If dark or emulsified oil is present in the gearbox, you should seek expert advice. This is more likely in sail drives because uh, 
what happens in cell drives is that down at the cell drive leg, uh, very often if, it, if the boat is used in, in uh, sandy waters or muddy waters, the seals down there will deteriorate. Water will get in through the back of the propeller and emulsify the, the oil. And if, if you find that in your sail drive, you have to lift out and drain the oil and take off the propeller and door leg and uh, replace two bearings. They're back-to-back -back bearing. One, sorry, the two seals. One, one seal is pointing out towards the propeller, which stops the seawater going in. And the other seal is facing the other way into the oil, stopping the oil getting out. It's not a, a difficult job, it takes about an hour and a half usually, but uh, you absolutely have to do it straight away or you're going to have big trouble with your bearings and an expensive uh, fix in, in the lower leg. Now, next, uh, after doing the oil, change your primary fuel filter plus the secondary fuel filter, and after that, bleed the fuel system there. With the, with the bleeding, uh, you have to make sure that you bleed it until all the bubbles come out and gouts of fresh fuel come out of the bleed screw. When that happens, you can turn down the bleed screw and you bleed the system and she starts straight away. We used to say, uh, fill your tank to the brim, reduce condensation over the winter, but with biodiesel, I'm not sure if that's good advice anymore. But it's quite a, a job emptying your tank of fuel altogether, which is the alternative. So I think most people will continue doing that. At this stage, check your coolant level and top if necessary. If if your coolant, if you have a Yanmar, uh, you should be using a textable having XLC, which is extra long at coolant. And uh, that lasts for three years. So at that stage, you should change it every three years. You mix it, it's a, a, an orange uh, type coolant, and you mix it 50-50 with water. And it's very good. You keep your engine galleries whistle clean. It's really good stuff. Now is the time to check your impeller for visible wear. You should uh, always have a, a spare impeller and gasket aboard. And if you, replace, if you need to replace your impeller, now you'll be glad you have the spares. The, the way to check the impeller is flex each vane back and forward and look at the roof to see if there's a crack. And also at the end of the impeller vanes, it's molded in a circular um, form. And if, if it's worn, you'll see there's a flat on it. If you have a flat or if you have a crack on any one of the veins, it's time to change the impeller. Now, the impellers actually uh, are made of nitrile and they're very tough. And if, they, if there's no water loss or anything like that, they will last for years. And so it's not always necessary to, to change, but it's worthwhile checking. Check your air filter. Uh, clean if necessary and replace. And at this stage, uh, I would check the drive belts, uh, the alternator belts, and the uh, water cooling belt, which was a separate. Now, the, the trick for, for checking the tension of the belts, uh, I always use uh, the thumb and the nail. And you press the belt in with your nail until it hurts the nail. And the deflection from straight between the pulleys will tell you if it's more than six mil, you have to adjust your belt. It shouldn't be more than six between the longest pulleys, longest gap pulleys. So you, you've more or less done a good search now, but it's, it's, it's also worthwhile flushing out this, the seawater side of your cooling, cooling system with fresh water and from a bucket, run the engine, start it up, run it, feed the the seawater pump with, uh, from a bucket and add in antifreeze when it's down to near the bottom and run that antifreeze through the system and as soon as it comes out the back, turn the engine on. Now, what you've done there now is, is you've uh, ensured that the seawater side of your heat exchanger won't freeze up in the winter and cause you problems and the coolant in the freshwater side of the engine is already antifreeze. So you, You've really covered the whole engine now, and, no, and you've also protected your thermostat as for against icing or that sort. Now, at this stage, you should top up your batteries with distilled or deionized water, charge them fully, and best practice is to disconnect them from your electrical system at this stage and leave them there for the winter. If your stern gland is of the traditional type with flax packing, 
Now is the time to consider renewing the old pattern and filling the stern freezer with fresh bees. Now this will need a lift out and it's, it's, it's quite a big job. But if your stern plant is of the Volvo lip seal type, the, the black rubber type, and now's the time to re-grease it with a special Volvo grease. And you can actually do this afloat. And uh, I have a tip for doing it. Uh, it needs uh, a good uh, quality a tube like you get for drinking lemonade from a glass. And, uh, and it also needs a, an eight millimeter feeler gauge. But the way to do it is to, uh, with the Volvo lip seal, is to push the feeler gauge into the nose of the lip seal and then fill the, uh, the little tube with grease and push it under the, the feeler gauge and push both in an inch. If you push it in an inch, you get it right midway between the two lip seeds and the valve of the seed. And then uh, the end of the, the, the tube, press it with a finger and run your other finger up and squeeze the grease into that valve of you. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, it, it, you could do it while, while afloat, um, which is quite a, a feat that way. And it's a, a tip I, I use for a long, long time. If you have a, the Packless PSS stern seal, which is the best of all types, there's no maintenance required whatever. Uh, but if you have lifted the boat out, you must remember to burp it when the boat goes back in, because the air will have got in there and you need to uh, press the, the, the bellows uh, under water, it gets in, and then leave it go, and that's it. That's all you have to do. That pack of stern seal is fantastic. It's the best possible stern glass seal you could have, and they, they give no trouble, whatever. They're fantastic. If you, your boat is out of the water, take the time to check your cotton sparing for excessive wear. Hold the preparer firmly and move it up and down and sideways. If you have more than one millimeter of movement, then you should replace your cotton sparing now. And if your anodes are well worn over 30%, then you should replace them now. And also check that they're wired together and they're to your engine well. The anodes are particularly critical for boats better than marinas, as stray currents can and will cause electrolysis damage to your propeller and in hull fittings. Your new anodes plus a short power isolation transformer, if fitted, are your best defenses against such an electronic system. Now, now is the time to check each of your seacocks, hoses, and jubilee clips. All seacocks should have two jubilee clips fitted at each end of the connected hoses. Now, you should be able to smoothly open and close each seacock. If there's any uh, tension at all in it, uh, and it's difficult to open up those, but you have to change that seatbelt. And uh, unfortunately, the high production French boats are very often filled with uh, plumbing type ball valves now, which are absolutely terrible. Uh, they don't last more than five years, and sometimes they last a lot less. And I found that an awful lot with Genos and Benetos, that if you look at the seacock feeding the engine, seawater pump, you'll find that it's green. And that means that it's lost its sink, it's kind of a, a, a electrolysis corrosion. And now the reason for that seacock being like that is because it's connected with the engine, which has electrical generation in it. And generally speaking, I found almost every one, which was more than five or six years old, was green. And, and that's a sure sign that the zinc is gone. From it. I, I was servicing an engine about 10 years ago, which was up in the heart. And, uh, the guy wanted a, a new stern gland. The owner wanted to watch me doing it, and he was there. And he looked at the seacock, which was in the end of the compartment. And he said, that's a, a funny color, isn't it? And he tapped it with a, a, a heavy screwdriver, and the bloody thing broke off. Now, that gives me a terrible shock, I can tell you. And I, I learned the list that day, that the green seacock is a very dangerous thing to do. And the two of us, uh, had a, a terrible shock. Fortunately, it was on the heart. Uh, we replaced uh, all the seacocks in this day, although the other ones weren't green, but we got such a shock that we, we replaced them with, with proper ones. I was able to get, at the time, stainless steel, 316 stainless steel, uh, through hulls, ball, ball, um, 
valves and hose valves uh, from uh, hose wind suppliers and we replace them all with proper seacocks at, at that stage. It's one to remember there are uh, alternatives nowadays. There's a Marilon seacocks, which are kind of a fiberglass type. And there's a new one uh, nowadays, which is 40 euros and it's all plastic. It's called, uh, it's a composite. It's an alternative to a uh, metal seacocks and if, when you have that, you don't have to connect all your seacocks to the engine. So it's, it's a good alternative. But do take a good look at them. If they're the cheap plumbing type, don't replace them with that because they're, they're made of brass. And unfortunately, the ball is usually made of metal steel foam. And the two different metals go against each other. And the zinc comes out and they're, they're not proper. You need to really have a wooden plug for every seacock, a soft wooden plug. You can buy a pack of them in the chapter is very simple. Drill a hole at the top of it and tie it to the right seacock, the right size. That would be a very good thing if you ever the seacock fails when you stop the boat, stop the boat. And it only costs a few pence. I'd suggest that you keep an, an engine log of all engine services, problems and remedies. This would be of particular value to your service engineer and any future prospective purchasers of your vessel who would be impressed and more likely to consider purchase if they see that. Now, engine spares, a basic minimum for coastal cruising, that's that's within 30 miles of our home port, would be an impeller and gasket, an alternator belt, a water pump belt if separate, a primary fuel filter, a secondary fuel filter, an oil filter, oil engine and gearbox oils, which are usually different, uh, fuses, premix coolant, some spare fuel in the container, and a basic toolkit, and your engine maintenance log. It might be no harm to have your handbooks and service manuals aboard if you can. We we'll talk about blue water spares and fixing things that float there. The most satisfying work I did when maintaining engines was the work of preparator. I had people approaching me and asking me to have prepared the boat for circumnavigation or for ARC or world ARC. And uh, my very first one was Donald Hurley, uh, who was preparing his boat for uh, Nostar. And uh, I gave him a solution for uh, charging his engine, which meant he had, he had only uh, half the fuel to take. And uh, his, his battery charging reduced from five hours to less than two hours, uh, which made a big difference for him. And he, he actually won his Nostar. First attempt. After that, uh, I had a, a, a chap approach me uh, in 2008, and uh, the, 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 the crash had just happened, and he declared that he uh, didn't cause this problem, and he wasn't going to pay for it, and he was going to sail away. So he did that, and uh, I spent about a month working with him, uh, preparing the boat uh, for uh, a certain navigation, and it was very satisfying work. Uh, it, it required an awful lot of thinking about what spares he was going to need, uh, about his maintenance techniques and, uh, and that for, for while in certain navigation. You should remember that if you're if you're doing long-term liverboard cruising, you will need to maintain your engine four times more often per year than if you're doing normal home water sailing, because uh, your engine will be doing that extra work. Great deal more. So you need three or four filter sacks a year, you know, and uh, all the rest of the spare anodes and everything else that's required, you will need. And uh, if you're away in a circumnavigation, you're talking five years, so you're going to talk about 20 filters uh, for your primary filter, 20 filters for your secondary filter, all these belts and all of that. Now, Mark will put up a, a list of the spares that are required for blue water engine repairs. It's a very comprehensive list, and it's it's absolutely vital. Now, as any doctor will tell you, prevention is much better than cure. So start off if you're going blue water with a fully prepared vessel. Anyone contemplating blue water sailing will need to prepare their vessel, and more importantly themselves, for any breakdown or problem that may be encountered before setting off. The key is to prepare yourself with your skills and experience before you go. It goes without saying that every part of your vessel your hull, rigs, bars, sails, steering gear, electronics, electrics, engines, generator, 
tank water and fuel systems, the autopilot batteries, and especially power generation systems should be professionally surveyed long before set off and brought back up to first class condition with a major effect. During this period, a hands on approach by the skipper and crew during the survey and subsequent rebuild would be invaluable in educating on all their systems and the maintenance these systems would require in the future. They must prepare themselves thoroughly for offshore sailing and they would bless the time spent in that process during their voyage. Ask your friendly service engineer to show you how to service your engine generator and be the end. That's what I did with each of the people that I helped prepare for offshore sailing. Fuel problems can be anticipated as you would bunker in remote places where fuel may be contaminated. So uh, take the advice that I mentioned earlier using the rack of filter fuel for me and uh, fitting the best possible fuel system you can. Now, I know recently that RACOR have come up with a fuel polishing filter system. And it's a, a filter system with an electric pump built in and it will allow you to fuel polish your, your fuel. As, a, as you know, when the fuel goes through the, the ejectors, uh, there's an excess of fuel which goes back into the tank. And you, you connect the, the fuel polisher to that circuit and uh, it's recirculating all the time and it will keep your fuel. Fuel polishing is basically uh, a fancy term for filtering your, your fuel. And uh, this, this new RACOR thing, uh, RACOR fuel polishing thing, is, is a brand new system that just come out with. And I think it's a very, very good idea to fit if you're going to do that. It's voyaging offshore is very tough on both sails, rig, and engines. And it's necessary to realize that a year sailing blue, blue water is equivalent to four years wear and tear in home. So the, your, your, your maintenance schedules have to change. You require a great deal of spares and you, you have to take things like, for example, if you're going for, away for five years, you need an exhaust elbow because um, the exhaust elbow is one of the things which uh, has hot seawater driven through it all the time. And hot seawater over 60 degrees is more corrosive than hydrochloric acid on metal. And consequently, the weld in your exhaust elbow is attacked from the inside. And, and one tip I would say to you uh, in, in maintenance is keep an eye on the weld of your exhaust elbow. You won't see the problem once it comes through from the inside to the outside. And the minute you see a rust, a piece of rust on the weld, you should know at that stage that your exhaust elbow is done. If you don't fix that problem, uh, you can get a lot of problems. And maybe a, a hydraulic block uh, with water going into your cylinder. So it's necessary to, to have one of those and its gasket with you um, if you're going on a, a long trip like that. I, I recommend also uh, that a spare starter motor and alternator is brought um, uh, board because if you're in the two motors are somewhere in, in the Pacific, in the Pacific Island, you don't want to wait three or four weeks for a spare part like that. What I did with those uh, in the boats that I uh, helped prepare was I brought the starter and alternator to my butcher who uh, shrunk wrapped them in heavy plastic back in back. And that preserved them, stopped them from rusting and they could be kept safely in the boat with uh, onto me. So that, that's that's pretty pretty important. I, I would say the thing that people should most concentrate on is power generation because uh, that's that's really important. But nowadays there are tremendous big alternators. And there's uh, options in uh, solar panels to help you along there. But you have to get your electrical system and your your generation system sorted completely before you go away. And uh, it, it would be well worth considering lithium batteries for example, because. Uh, with, with, without uh, end batteries uh, and proper batteries, you won't have refrigeration. You won't have the power to run your autopilot. And on circumnavigation, the autopilot is a great deal of work. In, in fact, um, Barry Hurley tells me uh, that, and he's a professional sailor, tells me that the only time he's on the tiller is uh, when taking the boat off the dock at the start of the next and bring the boat into the dock at the end of the test. And all the rest of the race, the uh, autopilot does the job. So it's, it's critical that you have the power for that. The 
one thing about uh, uh, refit and preparing your boat for, for this kind of work is that you have to uh, install the equipment, water makers and all that sort of stuff, and make sure that it's thoroughly tested before it's done. Like it's absolutely right. There's no point fitting stuff and then maybe on. You, you're asking for trouble. Now, uh, a proper engineering tool kit is essential and the ability to use it properly. Things like uh, battery drills, battery grinder, taps, dies, drill bits, all of that sort of tools, and all the tools you would need are, are, are critical. Um, I would, uh, I always suggested that you, that you measure the rig, each part of the rig, the lowers, the uh, uppers, the uh, forestay and backstay, and have those measurements written down in, in your log. And you sh the longest, uh, the longest element of the rig, which is usually the forestay, you should have a new one made up with the top terminal already swathed on and a Norseman fitting for the bottom. And if, if your forestay goes, you can change it and, and it's the right length already. If, if another shorter part of the rig goes, you can cut the end off and put the Norseman on and use that. So this is something that each of the circumvocation people I did with uh, took in the heart. And the other thing is, um, I recommend that Dyneema halyards should be fitted. And that uh, a, lo a longer, one longer spare halyard should be brought as well. And uh, that was very, very, very good advice, I think. And they took it. Uh, the, one of the guys who was going was a, a, a pilot, 45 year old pilot, and his wife and his two young kids, uh, 10 and 12, and uh, he had a Moody 47. And uh, I figured that his big problem would be uh, autopilot, that um, if, if the weather was very rough and that, uh, his wife would be looking after the kids and he'd be on his own. And if his autopilot uh, was in trouble, he was in big trouble. So we, we fitted a second autopilot and for good uh, measure he fitted a wind vane uh, with a, a separate steering paddle as well so he was well well organized for that sort of thing like this is what's going on uh, it was very satisfying dealing with people like that and uh, they were generally very happy one particular guy in uh, discovery 65 that I, I worked on and he was doing the world arc he went off and then um, he had ferocious weather on the way going down this day. His front wheelhouse windows were broken and the boat was flooded. And that was when he found that the uh, the new bilge pumps with which Discovery Yachts had fitted for him weren't connected to the, the switch. They weren't powered. They, they didn't work. And uh, he had a very, a very alarming time for this. Uh, they actually turned the boat back and brought the boat back to Southampton where they acquired it in Discovery. And Discovery had a, a big cost and replacing all the systems that were destroyed and the pump didn't fit in as well. Went legal and a lot of unhappiness about it. But uh, he got the boat uh, back ready for the following year for the RC and it's still going on. Um, okay, the, um, I, I briefly go through the, the list. Um, uh, I see Mark has moved through it there. For, uh, I think the important ones I mentioned, you know, the, 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 a, a full set of gaskets for your engine, uh, a, a full set of um, tubing, you know, for your engine, all the, all the little uh, water tubes and that uh, from the uh, heat exchanger and all of that, uh, a full set of those will be uh, there. Spare exhaust elbow, large selection of Jubilee clips, hose barbs, plumbing items, a set of injectors for the engine and for the generator, and set, set of cop copper washers for all fuel banjos and injectors for the engine and for the generator. I would recommend that you get the manufacturer to give you a parts, cat parts catalog for your engine and for your generator. You should have that aboard. You should also have a service manager 
and uh, an operator man. And you need to have the telephone numbers of the suppliers of every piece of equipment aboard. For example, you might have quite a lot of bilge pumps, uh, you might have uh, water pressure pumps for the hot and cold and all that. And you should have all the, their numbers of the suppliers of that. So, and, and take, especially the, those pumps, you should have spares in them. There, it's, it's critically important. A spare thermostat and gasket, a spare oil pressure center, and temperature center, uh, a, a spare propeller Woodruff key and not um, uh, spare sea cocks, belly sealant, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, O-rings, copper washers, and um, rivet gun, large infantry, running rigging, various um, lines and toilet spares, a couple of toilet spares. And after all that, um, I would say that it would be a very good idea to bring a copy of Nigel Calder's boat on and aboard. Because that's a really excellent uh, reference if you're stuck and want to be out to fix up that to have. I used to have it as a bedtime reading three years ago. So that's it. I hope that I've gotten something out of this. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted. Thank you very much, John. That was a fantastic talk and very detailed. Also, I've taken a lot of a lot of notes on the things that I intend to do. Whether they'll ever happen, of course, um, is another matter. Some engines nowadays come with two alternators on them. The engine that I have in my boat at the minute, Perkins 4236, has one alternator. Yeah. Okay. Seems to run everything, fridges and chart blotters and et cetera, et cetera. There's two alternators really needed nowadays. It's a very good solution, but of course it's an extra. The engine will only come with one alternator, so somebody has specified the second one. And I, I know that Mark's boat has uh, two alternators, and I think it's an excellent idea if you want to upgrade your, your charging capability. Of course, the second alternator can be, um, it can be bought as a, a, a retrofit from the, from the manufacturer. The, they have standard setups. So all the bits will come, including the belts and the new pulley. And if your alternator is over 100 amps, it will need a poly V belt. You know, the flat multi V belts, because mm -hmm. a standard V belt will be shredded by a 100 amp alternator. It just can't deal with it. Um, I fitted quite a few of those um, to be uh, going away. It was a very good solution, especially with a smart regulator. Um, and of course, the second alternator can be 24 volts or 48 volts, depending on what your requirement is. So it's, it's you're dead right, it's a great solution. Um, is it good, does it just, does it detract from the power the engine puts through the gearbox? Absolutely, it takes, it, it can take quite a load from the engine uh, and reduce the amount uh, for propulsion available for propulsion, but your engine needs to be big enough to, to manage that. You know, um, engines of boats today are, are bigger than they should be. And as a result, they're underloaded, which is not good for them. It's far better off to have a, a slightly a slightly overloaded engine than an underloaded engine. Mm. It, will, it will last longer and, and work better. What would you say is the main cause of water in the diesel fuel? Does it come in from the from the suppliers or is it from condensation? It it depends, of course. And um, if your if your um, if your tank is is uh, half empty and it's there over the winter and without without any heat in the boat, uh, there'll be a certain amount of condensation from the cold transfer uh, from the metal tank into the interior. But basically, every time you buy diesel, you're buying water and you're buying rust because it, it comes from metal tanks in, in, the, in the port and you're bound to have it. And if you saw the uh, two litres of water we took from Marcus's um, tank, it was, a, it was astonishing. I, I was really surprised. I didn't expect that much. And it was easy to see because nowadays the diesel is white and the the water of diesel was slightly, slightly emulsified. Emulsified is probably too strong a word, but it's slightly more opaque. 
and you could see it. And, uh, uh, so uh, you will find it in, in almost every tank. Like this. It that. seems to be talking the need for a bit of quality control among the suppliers. Uh, there's that too. There's mm -hmm. that too. And uh, unfortunately, uh, most yacht club tanks and, uh, and all of that don't have a filter system in it. Um, I know that uh, the Marine in Dunleary had a good filter system in their tank there. Uh, that was good. And, and some, some places do uh, act responsibly in that way. Also, of course, if you're buying diesel from a garage, as some people are nowadays, uh, people in most of the uh, marina owners in Cassel buy their diesel from garage because the diesel pump in the other marina is the most expensive diesel in Ireland. You know, it's really it's very expensive. So they go to a garage again. And that's probably likely to be cleaner because the garage fuel is resupplied more often. Uh, it has a, a, a greater throughput. But I would say that three years would be the maximum that you should go without checking that. And it's simple to check just from the top of the, the tank, put a, a tube down with your vacuum pump and take out a, a liter or two and you'll see straight away if there's water in it. You have to dump the water. And you could dump it into the, the, the rack or fuel filter funnel I spoke about. And, and put the diesel back in the tank and the water will be kept in the top of the pump. Sean, um, we in Poolbeg have a fuel filter on the supply line. So it should take out a lot of those problems. Sure. It should. That's, that's a very good uh, thing to know uh, for anybody fueling in Poolbeg. Sean, would you recommend a smart regulator? Um, what size and what would you recommend? Well, uh, there, there are several available. The, um, the suppliers will tell you if it's suitable or not for your uh, engine. You, your uh, alternator has to come off and uh, a wire has to be um, soldered to uh, both um, brushes. And the alternator is then run and one of the brushes will have 11 volts and the other will have a different voltage. And it's the one with 11 volts is the one you connected to the smart regulator and that does the job. Um, so there's one or two different uh, suppliers of them, but if you if you go for the the Balmar military spec alternator, it comes with a a separate plug-in smart regulator, and it's a great solution. Really, for success. Sean, on that the smart regulator, if you're going for wind and solar, you you probably have a battery management system. Do you need a smart regulator as well as a battery management system, or do you just feed your alternator into the, the BMS and let it figure out the voltage, et cetera? The smart regulator is separate. And um, if you have solar, uh, you should have an MPPT regulator, especially for solar. That's a different thing altogether. Because with solar, if it's a very, very hot day, uh, you might have to dump power rather than overcharge the batteries, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that kind of regulation is, is specific and differently done. But uh, nowadays, the power management systems like Pictron, they have, a, they have a suite of solutions for anything, any type of generation capability you have in your boat. They'll handle, um, if you plug into shore power, and the system will recognize that as shore power and make sure that the, that the solar power is operating at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all that kind of, they're, they're very smart. That was sort of behind my question. If you did go the Vitron route, you would still need a smart regulator, would you? Like, they're, 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 they're independent type concepts. Well, the thing about smart regulator is that it, it almost doubles the capacity of your battery storage right off. And uh, it will allow your battery to charge to almost 100% each time. Whereas uh, under the standard regulator, it only charge the 75% and it's very inefficient. And that's because cars are operated daily and several times a day. And the big problem with cars is that you don't want to overcharge your battery. So that's why they, they, they taper off the charge uh, at, at that period. The other thing in, in battery management is that uh, you can get a system now you, that automatically charges your engine start battery first, and only when that is fully charged will it charge to go to your house back. Now, fortunately, that's pretty simple because 
uh, engine starting is a simple thing which takes only a few seconds you know it's maybe 10 or 15 seconds and and your 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 diesel engine should start first time uh, after two revolutions it should start every time if it isn't doing that there's something that needs to be looked at and uh, but uh, so it doesn't take much charge out of the battery at all those kind of uh, battery switches will, will handle that on that but the, it's a it's a, a very complex thing which then manage all different types of batteries. I mean, lithium has a different charging regime. Uh, you know, AGM has a different charging regime uh, to, to flooded lead acid. And, uh, you know, flooded lead acid is getting, uh, and lithium is getting a little cheaper. No, they're still expensive. And there has to be a battery management system with your lithium battery. You can't fit a lithium battery uh, and expect it to do well uh, charging from normal load. It has to have a, a separate battery management system. So, and it's expensive there. They're still quite expensive, but there, there's nothing like them. They, um, your standard lead acid battery is, um, we give you about a thousand charge discharge cycle and, and a lifetime of uh, four years would be a good lifetime uh, in under normal circumstances where they're uh, not cared for properly. And caring for them properly might give you six years, but that's about it. Uh, the, you can't behave like that. Uh, lithium, you have to really care for properly, but it, it lasts five times longer than a, a lead acid. It can be discharged down to 20% and charged quickly up to 100%. They're very, very good at, at handling that kind of uh, thing through their own battery management system. They're, they're the next uh, but there's a cost uh, By the way, there's a new future, and Mark will show you a short video which will, will illustrate it. And uh, nowadays, you can put uh, an electric motor in place of your diesel um, on a, a small sail drive leg and a servo prop underneath, which means that the servo in the, in the bottom propeller case will alter the pitch of your prop so that when you're sailing, the motor becomes a generator and coupled with lithium batteries and with solar power for when you're at anchor. It's a fantastic solution and it's the future. And here is the video of the components. It's about the size of a, a Christmas cake and about six inches tall. There's the old system being taken down and He'll show you that there's the new one now. He's watch it. That's the inside. That's the seal there. On the right is the servo prop. There's the servo in there. And there's the, the pitch which can be altered uh, by a switch aboard. Now it's going back up. And it's a fantastic solution. And uh, it's, there's the control unit and it's just plugged into the motor and it's a fraction of the weight of a diesel engine and a tank of fuel, fraction of the weight. I mean, it's tiny and um, it's as powerful as any motor. There is the motor um, and Uh, etching the prop here so that he can put uh, anti on it. Okay. He's putting it on the, on the leg now. Uh, and uh, when he goes, he's... Uh, 
That's the future. And uh, he's a monohull and he has only two solar panels up. This is an ocean vault um, solution. And if you look at two solar panels, he's finding that he has enough generation for all the boat systems and uh, charging the batteries. Uh, and I think this solution is would be in credible in a, a multi-hull where you have more deck space for solar panels. But he's finding that it works for him completely. And if you want to see it, um, look up Uma Sailing. Yeah, but I see this as the future, uh, that, that diesels would be uh, changed for electric motors. And that's, I think that's the way we're going. See this become commonplace in five years' time. When, when the boat is sailing, that like there's a generator, is that correct? It acts as a generator when you, when you sail. And you, with the servo prop thing, you, you turn that onto the propeller is, is, is generating the most watts. And you saw that little um, yeah. instrument, uh, which shows the, the battery filling up and generating. It's, it's called regeneration, the way to go. No question. Sean, if you, if you don't mind me interjecting from the southwest of England. Not at all. Uh, I met a guy, in fact, a Swiss guy who has sailed the Atlantic many times, and um, he showed me his generation system, which was an EFOI fuel cell. Yes. And yes. it was able to run everything radar, collision detectors, yes. the fridge, everything from this EFOI fuel cell, which just takes a method of cartridges. Yeah. And I have to say, it's just such an amazing system that I, I'm seriously considering doing that to my boat although i probably don't need it but um it does mean i can just run the fridge to keep the gin cold all the time yeah there is a close yeah they're, they're absolutely i agree with you but it's just another generation system you know but if you can regenerate through sailing uh, through a watt and sea generator which is much the same as as i've just shown there which is an outboard leg on the transom and the propeller uh, activates a, a, an alternator inside the, the bottom leg, and and the the Von der Globe uh, sailors all had those on their boats. They typically had two just in case one broke down, and they went around. They needed a lot of power because the autopilots were on all the time, you know, and uh, they were fantastic. But yeah, absolutely, they, the hydrogen is is a great solution. Uh, the the problem is storing it and the initial cost. Uh, but there's no problem apart from that. Uh, it's, so it's a bit difficult to fit one of those things on our herd 28s, but um, I, think, I think the fuel cell might be the answer for you. It might, it might indeed. And um, I mean, you have to remember, uh, bus air or a national bus service at the moment have eight buses on uh, the, the, the journeys between the major towns uh, operating on hydrogen at the moment. And, uh, uh, is this hydrogen? I don't know. It's a fuel cell. You just put methanol into it. Yeah, it, I don't know how it does it. It's a hydrogen. Uh, oh, I see. And, and the, the, the idea is that the whole fleet will, will convert to hydrogen. Uh, and uh, in, in the major trucks, the big problem with diesel trucks is that they have to, hydrogen is the only way they can go. And we have to do this if we're to save the planet. You know, we, we really do have to do this. And so the, there's huge amount of uh, development work going on to produce those solutions right now. Hey, well, thanks for that. And thanks for your talk, Sean. It was, it was Very interesting. In, in the situation that you described, whereby the, uh, the exhaust water can go back into the engine, is it possible to rig some kind of a non-return valve system on, in that situation? Well, it can be avoided, of course, if, you, if, you, uh, if after three turns of the key, this is the this is the key thing. If your engine is failing to start, uh -huh. uh, you you it should start at two revolutions. It's a it's a four stroke engine, so two revolutions your engine to start every time you press the key, and and that's standard. That's normal behavior. If 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 it doesn't start and you hit it a second time, you should pause and think, what's happening here? Am I out of fuel, or what's the story? 
right? Uh, is, is, the, is the start of motor rotating quickly? Is the battery okay? Uh, now, the third time, uh, if it doesn't start the third time, stop, stop now, and turn the, uh, the seacock uh, feeding the seawater into the coolant off into the engine. Uh, if you, you risk, if you continue on, uh, the, the water you're pumping in every time you're rotating the engine will, will fill the water lock, the Vetus water lock, and then it will, if you keep on trying it, it will come back up the pipe until it's at the level of the valves and then go down through the exhaust valve into your engine. And uh, end of end. In oh, yeah, the, serious trouble then. Yeah, in, in, in the, in the Yanmars, the, the, uh, the connecting rods are specially designed to bend in such a situation. That avoids breaking the crank, yeah. right? And, and I've had a couple of engines where, uh, and of course, once, once the connecting rod bends, the piston doesn't go up enough to produce the compression. That would start that cylinder. It, that cylinder will never start again. Um, the engine, uh, if, if, if the other cylinders are filled as well, that engine will never. So the head has to come off, and the, the new connecting rods have to be put, put in, and that kind of a repair is, is usually uneconomic uh, nowadays. You know, it's a, it'll, be, it'll be a lot less serious than if your connecting rods weren't bending. It, well, well, yeah, but it's a disaster in any case. I, I, I typically had one or two a year where that happened. And, and the guys, the owners had had this, um, this problem with failing to start for ages. Now, uh, the the way to um, to check if your uh, compression is gone in your engine is is to and, and this is this is how I used to check out uh, if the compression was okay. You take off your air filter and you get one of those Cook's torches, you know, glow torches, and and you point it in the air inlet on your engine. If, if, your, if your engine uh, uh, compression is bad, she'll start instantly. Uh -huh. You know, it makes a huge difference. It'll start instantly. And then you know that your compression is bad and you need a uh, rebore and rings. And that, I, I, I test it. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a disaster when that happens. There are two further situations where your engine may be flooded. One of them is when you're flushing out your seawater uh, end of the engine uh, at the end of the season and putting in coolant. And the reason for that is that some people might think of connecting their freshwater hose direct into the cooling circuit. And uh, that's very dangerous indeed because it can, if your impeller is in any way damaged or one of the veins is, is off, you can pump water uh, directly in past the veins and fill up your water lock and flood your engine that way. So the way to get out of that is to apply the coolant to your engine by a bucket. And the way to do that is to, uh, when the engine is stopped, turn off your seacock, your seawater seacock, and disconnect it, the hose at that end. And when it's disconnected, put the end of that hose into a bucket and bring the freshwater hose to the bucket and fit a valve at the end of it, like a spray valve that you might use in the garden so that you can regulate the amount of water going into it. And uh, uh, half in the bucket and start your engine and regulate the hose valve so that the amount of water being taken by the by the seawater pump is the same as the amount of water going into the bucket, and uh, in that way, uh, you'd be safe. You're not you're not pressurizing or overfilling uh, the engine in any way, and uh, run it for about five or ten minutes, uh, and that will clear most of the salts from the seawater cooling circuit, and uh, then turn off your fresh water valve and allow the level in the bucket to go down so there's only one litre left in it and then put in a couple of litres of coolant and let the engine run on until all the coolant is sucked through and immediately that happens, stop the engine. Now what you've done there is that you filled the seawater coolant circuit with antifreeze and 
uh, that will preserve it over the winter, no matter what freezing conditions are there, and you haven't risked your flooding your engine in any way. The second situation where it can be flooded, and I've seen it only once, and it's very unusual, in that I was in a boat yard waiting my turn to be lifted out, and they were lifting a boat in front, and they lifted the boat, but they got the slings wrong, and the bow of the boat was down much lower than it should have been quite low down. And the winch operator continued and lifted the boat out and they, they power washed it and they anti fouled it. And then they put the boat back in again. And again, uh, they hadn't corrected the slings. It went in with the nose down. And when the owner start, tried to start the engine, the engine went plunk and stopped immediately. And I was asked to assist and I, I had a, an idea what the trouble might be. And I was right. What happened was that when the boat was nose down, all the water in the exhaust water lock was tipped up its holes and on in to the top of the valves and flooded the end. And a very unusual situation and a disaster. The yard weren't inclined to take the blame, but um, they did eventually sort it out. Uh, but the answer to it, the way to avoid it, is that there is in every water lock, there is a, a drain cock at the bottom before a lift out. It might be a wise idea to open that drain cock and drain all water from the water and then close the drain cock, of course. If the boat is lifted at the wrong angle, uh, there's no danger then of, of any water getting into the cylinders. So uh, you've avoided the disaster. It only takes two or three minutes to open that sea cock, and they're easy to open. And they're in every wheat or sea or water lock and in most of the metal water locks that I've seen. So that's the situation. And um, any way you can avoid such a depressing scenario is worth, worth taking the trouble. And Mark Friedman, how did you manage for power this year? You do a lot of anchorage. Like, how, how did you, your, your domestic power and everything else hold up? Um, we can go about three days, uh, and then we need the, to um, motor, basically. Uh, but I had a problem with the alternator, put the, put the kibosh on that. So we're down to the generator for a bit. But I'm still interested, I'm very interested in getting wind uh, to, to supplement uh, yeah. that. If we could get 400 watts uh, out of a wind generator, that would supply all our, our power. We, we could remain yeah. blind for definitely. I, I was a bit disappointed in our wind generator at first. But because I think it was a case when we would pick up the boat on the mornings, we'd go up, we would motor down to the marina, right, and get people aboard and go down the river. Right? There didn't seem to be much registering on the what, the what we're getting charging. But we had motored up to when we left the boat, the batteries were fully charged. We come back fully charged, so we didn't get much of a charge. But on the I, I left the fridge on, I, I rushed out the boat and we left everything on. And when I came down, the batteries were up at 80% still. So I was quite happy. The generator was doing a good job. <laughs> so, it was, yeah, so, um, but with the batteries being so new, and like when we typically go for a day sale, we're picking up the boat, it's engine has started, it's off for an hour or two, it started again and running up. It was very difficult to see what it was doing, but I was quite happy. It, it, it was working very well. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I was a month on the West Coast this year. And I have a smart regulator fitted, and I do have a fridge. It's a very efficient Waco fridge, and uh, I have a chart plotter and not a great deal more else um, aboard. And uh, we only went into a marina once to get fuel and to wash our clothes uh, in Dingle. Uh, but in the whole month, I never had any battery concerns whatsoever. Um, now, my load is probably less than yours, load. Uh, you know, I don't have an, an awful lot of electrical kit for that. Uh, I have the autopilot, but I rarely use it. I, uh, if using that, I probably uh, need to charge more often. But uh, I never had any concern at all. And uh, we, we did use the engine a bit. You know, uh, if, if I go below um, three knots or two and a half knots, I get a bit twitchy and turn on the engine. You know, so. <laughs> I think, Mark, that maybe you should look at a smart charger first rather than a wind vane. Well, that's that, that tends my question earlier, yeah, because I, I don't have a, a, um, a smart charger at the moment. And my alternator, I think it only produces about uh, 24 volts. It produces only uh, 
50 at most amps. Um, so obviously, you know, that's 30 year old technology, I know. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to research all of that over the winter before deciding on anything. Maybe. As Sean said that, you know, your, your ordinary charger will only give you 80% of your battery capacity, whereas the smart charger will give you 100%. And that extra 20% is, say, 40% of your battery capacity. So it's a lot. It is, yeah. It's a lot. It makes a big difference. You, you were 24, from what I remember, Mark, you were 24 volts of the night amp plus at 12 volts, isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit complex. Yeah, and both are, what are they, what you say, 50 amp? The, they're both 50 amp, yeah. It is very low, isn't it? Yeah, that is very low. That's a small alternator. Um, yeah. yeah, nowadays that's nothing, Mark. Yeah. A hundred, is there, an engine of your size would have a 150 amp alternator today. Yeah, I think our when we had the nanny engine on the Cronon, I think one of our alternators was 140, yeah. and the one that was specified for the batteries was 100. Yeah. So we 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 never had any any battery problems there at all. Yeah. Um, yeah back in uh, I I I consider in your case consider changing the alternators. I I look into that yeah and certainly get a smart regulator as well. A, 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 a more a simpler solution in many, many ways. The, uh, the difficulty with um, wind uh, charging is that um, if, you're, if you're sailing downwind, it's not going to be effective at all. It won't be working normally because you're moving with the wind. Um, and uh, at anchor, it can be a good solution if it's windy, for sure. Um, they can be noisy. They can cause vibration in the hull, which some people find very annoying. Uh, but they do, they do the job all right. Uh, but I, I, I would prefer solar uh, nowadays because solar is, is a lot more effective nowadays than it used to be. And I, I wouldn't go for flexible panels. I go for solid panels on a gantry uh, behind, behind the end of the boom. So that, so that there's no shadow, whatever. Shadow across a, a solar panel means the whole panel is in effect. Sean, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for all the information you've shared. Very enlightening for me. Um, in terms of servicing your motors, is there to be follow rec recommended spec by the manufacturers? Or do you have any anything based on your experience to share on how often we, we service our motors? Probably once a season, I would say, but happy to take your steer. Typically, um, if you're if you're if you're a, a standard sailor sailing in home waters, once a year, um, uh, if it's more than a hundred hours, you might have to serve second. But typically, um, most sailors don't do much be above fifty hours on on their uh, engine a year, and uh, fifty to hundred hours you, you service it once. Once a year, and the optimum time is at the end of the season, at layup time. Uh, the reason for that being that uh, when you finished maintaining your engine, you're leaving the engine sitting in new clean oil, yeah, uh, which is very important because uh, the black oil is full of um, nasty stuff. Like uh, uh, there's a lot of nasty stuff which attacks raw metal like cylinders and that kind of thing. Sulfur, for example, is, is the lubricant of diesel. And so you have a soup of sulfuric, a mild soup of sulfuric acid in the oil. Now, the oil is black as a result, and the oil is designed to take care of that. But actually, it makes a great deal of sense to change the oil at the end of the season so that, that the engine is sitting in clean, new, non-sulfuric, Acid oil over the uh, layup, the, the layup period, and, and that's that's why it's very important to do it once a year. Thank you very much, Sean. That You're was welcome. a tremendous talk. I have, as I said, takes quite a few minutes. You're very welcome. All of us, guys. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. That was great. Thank you. Fantastic. Good Thank you, Sean. Good night, Thanks, Sean. Fantastic stuff. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.